Hello? How is this sound? Good? Well, welcome to the lecture series. We are really glad to have you here. This is night two of our series on the steel mills. Uh, two weeks ago, we heard from uh, Mr. Rat, uh, Radatovich um, on kind of the, the rise of the steel mills. He gave us a really uh, thorough history of them. And then tonight, we're going to be hearing about uh, the era when the steel mills tanked. Um, I want to go over a couple of housekeeping items real fast. One is that if you would like to be entered into just a free raffle for an autographed copy of Rust Belt Boy, um, there is raffle stuff out by the front door. Um, so feel free to do that. Uh, there are also refreshments, coffee, caffeinated and non, and water bottles and cookies. Feel free to take some of those on your way out. There's um, bathrooms downstairs. If you go down these stairs, straight back in the hall, then there's like a hallway to the right. It is, um, there's more than one stall, but there's no like door and it's not, it's not gendered. So just, um, just be aware of that. Feel free to, to maybe give a little holler um, to make sure no one else is in there um, uh, if, you, if you need to use that. So also, I want to make a really quick non-lecture series announcement. Uh, on your chairs, as you saw, there are um, petitions, and, pro and on each row, I think there is a, a QR code if you are a techie and want to do that. That is a petition for a different project that the Beaver Falls Community Development Corporation is doing right now. We are submitting a $995,000 grant next week in order to completely rehab the first floor of the old Newster building, which is right through those windows, so that neighborhood north, the Children's Museum can move in. So what we're just asking is to a show of community support for that. So if you can sign one of those, or if you want to use, um, there's an online one that the QR code will take you to. Feel free to just share uh, information about that. We'd, we'd really appreciate it. Um, yeah, and let, uh, it's, it's kind of a big push we're making for the next week and a half still. So feel free to let people know you don't have to be from Beaver Falls or even Beaver County to sign it. So we'd appreciate, we'd appreciate that. Okay, back to the lecture series. Um, we are doing, as I said, we're talking about the steel mills and we are really excited uh, for our speaker. And I'm gonna ask Brad Fry, a uh, professor at Geneva College to introduce our speaker for the evening. Thanks, CJ. You can tell that she's from New Kensington and not Beaver Falls because if she was from Beaver Falls, we'd never have free raffle tickets. We'd be doing a 50-50, <laughs> just saying. Uh, but um, hey, I, I, I want to uh, just take a moment and do a quick commercial message, OK, for the book, Rust Belt Boy, if you haven't uh, seen it yet. Um, when, when I agreed to introduce uh, Paul, I, I thought it would be polite to read the book, you know? So I bought the book and read it, you know? And, but, I just have to say this, that uh, as soon as I got it, I fell in love with it. I couldn't put it down. And it's a, it's a fantastic book. I don't get any kickback for this. Um, but uh, for two reasons. One is, if you grew up in Ambridge, or you grew up in Beaver Falls, or someone like me from Duquesne down in the Mon Valley, this, this book is just our story. It, it's just... Uh, Every chapter was like amazing, um, but it's not just for people like me who grew up in a mill town, but I think for people who just want to know things about that era, what that culture that was so rich and important was like, this, this is a book. The second thing is that it's, uh, it's just beautifully written. Uh, I'd say captivating. So, so if you get a chance uh, and you don't win the, the freebie, you know, you might want to... Uh, okay. Well, you're not here to hear me do a book review, so. Um, but I'm uh, I'm just delighted to uh, introduce uh, Paul Hertnecki. Um, he lives in Hancock, New Hampshire, with his wife uh, Robbie, and as I as I said, grew up in Ambridge, studied at Pitt and the Bennington Writer sem seminars. And I just say that because if you read the book, you'll find out he dabbled in a lot of different occupations. But Paul is a writer. That's who he is. That's what he does. He writes stories and essays and scripts. He's an award-winning writer, having written for the Boston Globe, the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, NBC News, Comedy Channel, uh, and many, many others. Um, 
and he's currently faculty uh, on the faculty at Chatham University. And how you live in New Hampshire and be on the faculty in a Pittsburgh University, I'm saying he must also have the gift of bilocation. So please, uh, please help me in welcoming uh, Paul Hertnecki. Thank you, Brad, and thank all of you for coming. Thanks, Carmita, for inviting me. Uh, thank you to this wonderful organization for inviting me, and thank you for coming out tonight. It's not the easiest night to come out. Um, and for all my friends and family who I see here, it's very gratifying to see you once again. Uh, this, was, this was a labor of love, and so to come back here and, and talk about what happened you know, it's one of those assignments that uh, you really like to get, and I lived through that time. But at the same time, after I wrote the first few things I'm going to talk about here, I first 15 minutes of this talk, <coughs> I came upstairs and said to my wife, I think I'm going to have a hard time making this funny. Um, it won't elude me forever. I, you know, I will tell you this, I was happiest to hear that there is caffeinated coffee. <laughs> Feel free at any time to fight off the nods by fueling up. And I will not take it as an insult. It's happened before. Uh, so as a starting point, I also want to thank my siblings. I see a number of them here. I see almost all of them here. <laughs> I think I may have been destined to leave, even though I loved growing up here and I had great parents and a great home. I was always full of wondering about the wider world, the, the world I hadn't seen. And it's, it's my siblings who made that happen because my parents needed, at the end of their lives, they needed my siblings there. But I think in the middle of their lives, they really wanted my siblings there too. So they enabled, they made it possible for me to have a feeling of security about this place and about my family so that I can, could go off and do some of the half-assed things I did. <laughs> um, <coughs> Yeah, I, I wish I could put that more delicately, but I really can't. <laughs> um, I'm going to keep dropping that pen until it becomes part of the routine. Um, so I can't say it a whole lot better, and I'm going to do this. I'm going to warn you that because I'm a writer primarily, and I know we have speakers, and preachers, and sermon specialists in this audience. I know them. I see them. That's not exactly my forte. Writing is, so I'm going to start this out with the way I started the book um, and, and how that changeover from the dominance of the steel industry to where we are today started to happen. Prosperity allowed my grandparents and parents to remain in town with every expectation that succeeding generations would do the same. But my generation's economic prospects fell away at the same time all Americans became more mobile. And ours, the baby boom, was restless generation to begin with. Between 1975 and 1995, half of the baby boomers left hometowns in a swath of geography that runs roughly from Troy, New York, south to Baltimore, west to St. Louis, and north to Duluth, Minnesota. Half of all baby boomers. And it was one of the biggest, it was the biggest generation ever born in America. When heavy industry began to collapse in the late 1970s, boomers were between 15 and 35 years old, either in the workforce or about to be. The steel industry alone lost nearly 300,000 jobs in the blink of an eye, setting off a widespread exodus, 
one that equaled the largest internal migration in the United States history. Ironically, roughly six million African Americans fled into the North when the Industrial Revolution began. And the same number of industrial workers moved out when the era ended a hundred years later. But the Great Migration North took 50 years to unfold, whereas the emptying of the Rust Belt took only 20 years. So I was in good company, or lost company at any rate. Graduating with an English degree from the University of Pittsburgh was not the most economically advantageous place to be. <laughs> so I took a job as fast as I could. Crash and all, most of my family still lives around Pittsburgh and has watched it rise from the ashes. One upside of relying on a single industry meant that the speed with which it fell affected the speed of its recovery. Pittsburgh hit bottom hard and has bounced back even more quickly than similar cities. In the 1990s, the county surrounding Pittsburgh had the second oldest population in the United States, just behind Palm Beach. <laughs> and its schools, social welfare, and health systems were forced to innovate. They have, breaking new ground in urban education, devising community medical systems that keep elders near home. Like tempered steel, the locals have been made sharper and stronger through extreme stress. No one knows this better than you do. Those who have moved away often describe a feeling of push and pull with their hometowns, acknowledging a gravity that keeps them in orbit around their roots. The relationship thrives at a distance, explaining why there are Pittsburgh Steeler bars from Vancouver to Miami and from Belfast to Shanghai. When it came to selling this book, my public relations guy who grew up in New England, when I told him I would go and talk at Steeler bars, he had no idea. <laughs> he had no idea how many there were. <clears throat> so they serve as embassies and surrogates for members of what demographer James Russell calls the Berg diaspora and are the natural result of a mass emigration, as well as a reminder of how globalization of an industry can, can lead to the global pollination of a culture, our culture. Sons and daughters lucky enough to feel attached to a distinct hometown know how it works its way under our skin and into our being. Pluck a hair out of my corpse a hundred years from now and DNA evidence will show, up, show that I grew up in Ambridge, one place on Earth, starting in 1955. Biologically, this always gets me, I am tied to it, but that's just the beginning. Nearly all of the following stories are set in Ambridge and Pittsburgh, but every American settlement has seen waves of immigrants. Those waves have come and gone they come and go without us recognizing their singularity, their influence, and the pattern they follow. I have written these stories to acknowledge the six million boomers who moved away from Milwaukee and Youngstown and Scranton and all the places in between, and in appreciation for the six million who stayed home, who supplied the gravity, took care of the parents, the towns, and each other. That was the beginning. <laughs> Thank you. It's really hard to write things down when you keep crying. Um, <laughs> but that's how deeply felt this, uh, this book has been. So my father, when I, when I would come back, I, I moved to Boston in 1978. Uh, I had been working for a trucking company in Coriopolis, having left Pitt because somebody offered me a job writing threatening letters to, to truckers. <laughs> um, and I, I, I got good at that pretty easily, pretty quickly. And I had worked in the Armco pipe mill in Ambridge. Um, I 
didn't really want to continue that. And Boston was a place where I had a cousin and a landing spot. So I went to Boston to look for a job and found one in an alternative newspaper. And that's where I met my wife. And I moved to Atlanta. That's the next job I could find. Remember, these millions and millions of baby boomers were all looking for jobs at the same time. And so we were kind of grabbing opportunities wherever we saw them. You never knew which way they would lead. And so from Atlanta, I would come and visit my parents here. My wife's parents are, lived in Connecticut, and we found that we used all our vacation time visiting family. So we really never had a vacation because family meant a lot to us. And we'd come here, and I saw what was happening. My father, in 1983, lost his job at American Bridge, where he'd been for 30 years at 56 years old. He was retired at 56 years old. In order to make ends meet, he had to then work for another 10 years doing side jobs as a draftsman for American Bridge. One of the things, I just kind of get together what really, you know, the, the, what happened here. In 1974, there was the first of two global recessions. And these re recessions had lots and lots of ripple effects. Materials for the steel industry, the cost went up. Everything that was associated with steel. The cost of energy to run the steel mills went also up through the roof. Transportation, whether it was for the barges coming down the river or the trains taking the materials away or bringing them, those costs also went up. The cost of labor went up because we had good, aggressive unions that fought for the rights of workers, that fought to keep people who worked in a steel mill middle class, having a house of their own, being able to support their families without having six jobs. The value of the dollar at the same time went down because we were competing with foreign competitive foreign producers. And the mills that were being built, the new mills that were being built in Korea and in Japan were being built with the best technology available. They took fewer people to run them. It was, e it was easier to do. So steel coming from those countries became incredibly cheap. And those imports drove down the value of the dollar. While, while they also drove, they were c competitive with the U.S. steel industry in making automobiles, in making appliances, and believe it or not, consumer durables, the things like washers and dryers, and that sort of thing, refrigerators, had once had been built to last then. And so many of the households in America had already been equipped with a washer and a dryer and a refrigerator. And this is before producers learned that handy planned obsolescence business that we all live with today. Not only that, but executive comp compensation was constantly climbing. Financial services and services in general were eclipsing manufacturing. And so it was much more lucrative to, to be in the service industry. Remember the service industry? And, and so they had to pay their executives more. When LTV closed the Alquipa plant, or was when, not when they closed the Alquipa plant, but when they bought Republic Steel and moved 450 executives from, from the U.S. Steel offices in Pittsburgh to Cleveland, they did so at the cost of $50,000 a piece. That was $22.5 million dollars in 1983 dollars, just to move the executives. Meanwhile, the 10,000 jobs at JNL, after LTV acquired it, went from the, by 1985 to 2,500 jobs. At American Bridge, 4,500 jobs in, at its peak 
in 1984 went to zero. Crucible in Midland, another big producer, had 4,700 people working in Midland in the 1970s, and by 1982, they had 200. You can imagine the ripple effect of this. Industry basically abandoned workers, and it also diversified. One of the reasons this was happening is because the unions were having a hard time figuring out how to cooperate with the companies. The companies' doors were not open to that cooperation, and the companies became very much beholden to the markets, to, to always having increasing quarterly profits. And it's very hard to invest in infrastructure, in, in modernizing plants, in those kinds of things, when you constantly have to be supplying profits to compete with other industries. So I remember my father was skeptical of these things. He came home one day and he said, God, I love the union, but they did something that I don't understand how it's going to work. Every five years, we're going to get nine weeks vacation in a block. And every, maybe somebody else can supply the years for me, maybe it was closer to eight years, we were going to get 13 weeks vacation. A sabbatical, Brad, a sabbatical. If we could be done without for 13 years, how important are we? What's going on here? How is this sustainable? And so we sort of saw the writing on the wall even at the dinner table. Um, so on this very day, April 6th, 1982, David Roderick, who was the CEO of U.S. Steel, announced that U.S. Steel would be shrinking. The largest industrial powerhouse in the world was going to scale back. And one of the reasons they were going to scale back is they found that oil drilling was more lucrative for their shareholders. This is the way the economy sort of changed. Um, I'll point out, by the way, that David Roderick's education, he, I don't think he was a bad man, but he was an accounting major. <laughs> he was a statistician. So when people accuse people of being bean counters, they're not just being crass. This was the truth. Unemployment in Beaver County in 1982 was 14%. More than one out of every 10 people you knew who could have a job couldn't get a job. In 1983, one year later, it was 23%. And the workforce itself, between 82 and 84, the workforce in Beaver County dropped by 10,000 people. They were the ones who were going away. They had to leave. They had no choices. They left their houses in foreclosure. Some of them rented their houses out. We can find it in every one of these communities. They rented their houses out. Sooner or later, nobody could pay fair market value for those houses, for the rentals. And so they, they you know, made it uh, Section 8 to house the people who needed housing, desperately needed housing, but couldn't afford to pay for it. The population decline here in Beaver Falls from 1940, when you learned maybe in the last lecture about how these places built up, that everything you see around you today was built to accommodate the workforce, in 1940, from 1940 to 2000, some of us lived all those years, Beaver Falls lost 50% of its population, half its population. New Brighton lost 30% of its population. Rochester lost 40%. Beaver lost 20%. They got away with it a little more because service industry, professionals, academics, that sort of thing. Manaka lost 20%. The glass, wasn't there a big glass factory in Manaka? And it continued on, didn't it? I th okay, it's surviving, and that's, hence the number is not so high. Freedom lost 50% of its population. Ambridge lost 
percent of its population. And Aliquippa, 65 percent. I, so this was the point where I said, this is a really terrible tale to tell. <laughs> but I started thinking about what went right, what survived, what small light stayed lit. And I know that this gathering, there are a lot of people who are strong members of communities of faith. The communities of faith, the churches in Ambridge, the, the, all of the parochial schools that were in Ambridge and in Beaver Falls and in Rochester and all these places, they were hanging on. They were keeping it going. The pierogies sales never missed a step. <laughs> Did one pizza place close down? If so, call it out. <laughs> I mean, not only did we need inexpensive food to eat, but these were the things that these were the things that could hang on. Um, but even that, for a while, was you know we know how threatened it was. Um, communities of faith also share. Uh, in their strong belief in each other and in their particular faith. But people are also inclined to believe in large institutions. And those paternalistic manufacturers were the institutions where that kind of faith survived, kept, kept on. You wanted to believe that you would always work at that mill, that you would retire from that mill, that your grandfather had worked there, and if your son chose to work there, your son and your daughter, they could work there. That it would go on and on. So the closing was more than economic, and it was more than social. It was deeply psychological. And I don't know, there, there are faces here that I think remember this, that there was more than, a, than, a, than an air of loss and desperation. There was personal loss and desperation. When you work in a place, my buddy Rory McCoy back there reminded me of this last week, of how many people we knew had 18, 19, 19 and a half years in a place before their pension took, took hold and the place shut down. So all of that that you had been working for, that's a loss. And that's going to create a sort of universal grief. The people back here, when I would come back to visit, be with my family, be with the parishioners of Divine Redeemer, my church in Ambridge, you could tell that they were holding on to each other. And at the same time, sons and daughters like me were disappearing and going away. And they were sending us off as if to go not to war, but to prosperity. It echoed what was happening in Europe before their grandparents came here. That we, we had to go, many people had to go away. And some people also of our parents' generation, we don't call it that anymore, but it was the Sun Belt expansion. The Sun Belt. What could sound more promising than the Sun Belt? It was this beautiful place with beautiful weather and, and it seemed ideal. I lived there. It was not ideal. <laughs> it was not ideal. It was, it was crowded. It was busy. It was suburban. I, it, was, it, was, it was homogenous. I would say to my friends, when's the last time you talked to somebody who was over 60 years old? We didn't ride public transportation. We couldn't see us. We couldn't sit down next to an older person. We were all sort of homogenous. And we were from Detroit, Chicago, Columbus, Cleveland, Indianapolis. Those were where my friends were from. Not only that, I found that <clears throat> when you look outside and it's 93 degrees out there, it looks beautiful. But you don't want to go out there. <laughs> so you hid in your air conditioning the way we hide in our heat. And you got into your air-conditioned car the way we get into our heated car. 
The only advantage is you don't have to shovel sunshine. <laughs> but that was about it. Um, and that says nothing about the people. The people in the culture were great. I loved that. In any case, an industry that, that, peaked, in, uh, that peaked at 650,000 workers, the steel industry, soon dwindled to under 200,000. And that's, that's what we were facing. But these little bits were giving me, were giving me hope. And yet, in the communities of faith, churches were closing. In, let's, my numbers here, uh, there were 313 parishes in the Pittsburgh Diocese. I don't, I don't see my numbers here, but uh, there are 315, 13 in the Pittsburgh Diocese. Next year, the Bishop of Pittsburgh predicts that there will be 57 parishes. There are only 117 now. So that strain of faith took a beating. But it was replaced with new communities of faith. And we see that represented today. That doesn't necessarily go away. Visiting Ambridge in the 1980s, stores were closing, restaurants were closing, churches were closing. The unions were, unions were being broken over and over again, both by industries shutting down and by our dear president at the time, who many blue collar people fell in behind, Ronald Reagan. One of the first things he did in, in office was broke a union broke a powerful union, the Air Traffic Controllers Union, and he set the tone. Global trade was diminishing, uh, was outsourcing our manufacturing. The role of government was stressed, government was stressed as a bad thing. So taxes were lowered. We couldn't help as many people as we used to. There were crushing blows that came from all of this. And the worst thing was standing outside of this place, looking in, it was ignored. I don't know if you remember this, but the nation didn't want to talk about what was going on here or in Scranton or in Troy, New York or in Detroit. They didn't want to talk about it. They wanted to talk about the Sun Belt. They wanted to talk about profits. They wanted to talk about quarterly earnings. And there I was in Atlanta in an office building, wearing suits every day, uh, making up uh, jingles and advertising to sell more American cars and beer. And what I was seeing happen here was breaking my heart. But here's the thing. Those little lights stayed on, and they stay on today. And that's part of what brings the city of Pittsburgh back. What we're all waiting to see is how the places around Pittsburgh will come back. Slowly, they seem to be doing that because of organizations like the one that sponsors this and the commercial entities that support organizations like this and the communities of faith who support organizations like this. This is how it's going to happen. And I'll tell you why I have an indication of that. I try to, I try to tell my neighbors in New England that I'm not a Yankee. I'm a Pittsburgh guy. But they start seeing more evidence of me becoming a Yankee. And I'm not trying. But when you heat your house solely with wood for 28 years, you have to do things that Yankees do. You have to see things like that. What I saw in New England, and here's the thing, when this book came out, so many people from places like Lowell, Massachusetts, this was where some of the biggest textile mills in colonial America were, Fall River, Massachusetts, the shoe factories in Maine, the brass works in Connecticut, they were the manufacturing center of the United States and, and also farming in New England 
was huge. They fed the country, dairy farms. And as time moved on, going to upstate New York where there wasn't a granite boulder every five, every five yards in your field to break your plow turned into a much more advantageous place to farm. And then things continued to go west. Right down the street from where I live is a dilapidated clothespin factory. These places are still struggling. Some of these places are still struggling, but they are continuing. They're trying and innovating as much as they could. The paternalistic effect of a giant corporation being responsible for the economic well-being of people, of a town, is a lopsided kind of power dynamic. And when that left New England, those people realized they had to get together village by village and town by town and take charge and, and invite innovation and welcome imagination. I was talking with Chris Paget this morning. One of the things that m put a little bit of wind behind my back when I was young is I found that repeatedly, and this was a tragic thing, and I'm not running this place down at all because we all know how it happened. There were the way things were done. They were done socially this way. They were done economically this way that we had calcified into a place that did not welcome new ideas. And sooner or later, we did not welcome new people. But we, because it was great the way it was, so it was very hard to germinate innovation and new ideas in, in this place. It's funny how after, if anybody's done any farming or gardening, after a field lays fallow for a number of years, how many new things will grow that never could survive before. I think that analysis of New England is part of what gives me more hope for what I see here. I'm just going to read to you a little bit again, if you don't mind. Um, that it, something that illustrates this point. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about um, when, I, when I got to uh, Boston. little story here. I'd, I'd just gotten there. I'd gotten my first paycheck. I worked in a place between Harvard Square, near Harvard Square. And I had embarked on a new adventure, now eight weeks in Boston, and my job in the circulation department of the paper, because I'd worked at a trucking company before that, gave me a sense of permanent. I would move out of my cousin's house, rent an apartment, find my footing among these people who had an entirely different bearing than I did. When I looked down, I saw the wrongness in my shoes. They were two-tone, black and gray, something Sonny Corleone might wear. <laughs> I fingered my gauzy shirt, and thought I might be trying too hard. But these were, the, these were the 70s, and who cared about clothes? I was the age of a graduate student, had big hair, yeah, really, <laughs> <laughs> and moved easily among strangers. Near the center of the square, I heard the blues rising out of a doorway of a basement club named Jonathan Swift's. Of course, Cambridge, they're going to name a bar after a literary figure. I sprung for the cover charge and descended into the squeal of slide guitar. After buying a beer, I found a place to stand behind a few rows of seats, closed my eyes, and drifted along the swells of a saxophone solo. I separated the odors and then let them blend again. Beery floorboards, summer bodies, hot amplifiers, cigarettes, marijuana breath, and herbal essence shampoo. The long hair of the girl standing next to me kept tickling my forearm, and I didn't want to interrupt it, so I held my eyes closed and fell into the music. Applause called me back to the room, and I looked down to see the woman beside me clapping, tossing her hair to the side. She reached over her head with the other hand and pulled it behind her ear. Nice beaded, beaded earring, I thought. She smiled at me, then looked back at the stage, sipping from a plastic cup. I just love John Mayall, she said. Fuck John Mayall. I said, she said, turning toward me, she surprised me. I hadn't expected her to talk to me, and I knew nothing about Mayall. 
why? It was all I could squeeze out. She said something like, his blues find me. I don't remember what I said, only that she asked, are you from around here? A question I took to mean that I didn't appear to be a student. No, you, I asked. She was from Evanston, Illinois, which geography freak that I was, I knew was outside Chicago. For some reason though, I hadn't expected her to ask the same question and a precise answer might crack the new persona I had been fashioning for myself there. <laughs> and you, she asked, a uh, little town outside Pittsburgh. Which one, what's its name? It doesn't matter. <laughs> yes, it does, she shot back, a little perturbed. Ambridge, she asked me to spell it, so I did. Oh, like Cambridge without the C. I was struck by the similarity which began and ended with that initial C. <laughs> Cambridge, originally Newtown, was renamed to match its aspirations. Its eventual power and privilege, erudition and stateliness, all its history and money, presidents, preachers, philosophers, its rowers pulling skulls up the Charles, sweating for sport. Ambridge, originally economy, named for its landlord, the American Bridge Company, its steel, smoke, and football, corruption and soot, its displaced immigrants and fractured languages, thugs and brawlers and bookies and mobsters and barge loads of ore and coal grunting up the Ohio, where nothing but carp and catfish could survive. Cambridge, a tangle of streets lined with bookstores and libraries, galleries and museums, coffee houses, theaters, dormitories, and think tanks. Ambridge, a simple grid of company houses, bars, churches, pizza joints, machine shops, Sons of Italy, Polish Falcons, factories, vegetable patches, alleyways, all night diners, shrines to the Virgin, more bars. The Mayall fans comparison triggered a psychic excursion and then I snapped out of it. I looked all over the dark basement and tried to catch a whiff of her, but she was gone. She was interested enough to ask me about me to demand an answer. How could I let her slip away like that? Where had I gone? I was trying to immerse myself in this new place to forget about Ambridge and one simple mention sent me off into space. She probably thought I was stoned. <laughs> I'll say more, but there's one other piece I want to read you before I run out of time. <clears throat> I'm grateful for the promise flickering over my hometown and this one, this one that I drove around in today to get a sense of again. After meeting the Australian developer who I started this book talking about, who had come to Ambridge to do some, to buy 450 acres of brownfields, um, my acquaintance with the place revealed stories I had never heard or been too self-absorbed to appreciate. It's the way it is when we're under 25. Not everyone, but I was. Now when I see, an industrial, see industrial rust and ruins like the hollow American bridge office where my father had bent over a drawing table for 30 years, its present condition, which it's not there anymore, its present condition seems only temporary. An English writer, Christopher Woodward puts it, a ruin, and there are plenty that we see here, is a dialogue between an incomplete reality and the imagination of the spectator. Walking among the eyesores today, I hear echoes of the past and lively conversations about the future. My family keeps me tied to the tenuous yet enduring belief that has graced Ambridge and this valley, I'll add, from the beginning. That this, this particular place had given birth to grand schemes and redemptive dreams, to fortunes and philosophies, to treachery and charity. Its resources and situation made fertile ground for growth, economic, industrial, serious, social, spiritual, and personal. Exploitation and greed challenged its survival. 
but certain resources persisted. The river flows cleaner. The sun still bathes its hills from early morning until dusk. The newer and new arrivals push seeds of their own dreams into the soil. For 300 years, Western Pennsylvania, like the entire industrial heartland, was shaped by newcomers. To some extent, that's still true. But like never before, its vitality comes from those who have stayed. My friends and family are among them, and here, by the way, a compassionate union leader, a prominent journalist, teachers, counselors, investors, restaurateurs, crime fighters, cooks, artists, poets, and a small army that still comes home filthy at the end of a shift. Rescuing the Rust Belt, you are my heroes. Mass is over, I can take off the vestments. Um, you know, one of the things that I can't help but point this out is, is that that aspect of imagination, that aspect of ideas being able to catch and grow, no matter how small or how grand, makes all the difference in the world. And when Ambridge desperately needed new blood, new ideas, new spirit. Trinity Sem Seminary came to that town, a, a denomination that m mostly chose the Anglican Church, mostly chose leafy campuses <laughs> and to and English gardens. And they moved to Ambridge with a sense of mission to live among people who needed the spirit. And they have made, that institution has made a, as big a change in Ambridge as I think American Bridge did. And it spurred a growth there, a growth of spirituality. There, the churches are being refilled by new churches. What was once the Italian church is now a Coptic church with the largest collection of Coptic literature in the country. These things are happening in all of these places. If we can open our minds and open our hearts to the people who want to come. It's occurred to me recently that I, th I think this is my personal belief, and this is where I'm going to stop. Immigrants are the best people. <laughs> the only better people, to classify better and best and worst people, but better people are probably refugees. Let's stay open to those who want to come. New England has em embraced me. In another, I've been there for 30 to 40 years off and on. I've lived in four of the six New England states. They're starting to accept me. <laughs> but I, I think that the same kind of acceptance goes on here. We have a legacy of that. And I admire and, and feel in my heart that this, that optimism reigns supreme here. Um, and if not, then just take a little time to look around because somebody is going to be inspiring and it's not hard to find. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody have any questions, or have I exhausted all of them? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you had brought up in 74 the Georgia Redemption Project. Did you ever do any correlation between this and taking a step of those standards and studying them and the possibility that this would be a sustainable action? That could have been a good, uh, y you yeah. have, it sounds like, yeah. That's one of the thoughts that yeah. Yeah, remember when we used to actually be able to back up our money? <laughs> you have gold in your pocket? Actually, Wait for me outside. I have, I have a silver <laughs> coin and I carry it for young people so they know what real money looks like. Oh, that's great. Because this is what we get paid with. And now we don't. Because 
page of some company script, you know, from um, right. uh, where the coal miner days, and they could only send a script of a company story. So we kind of turned America into that. And you kind of don't want to forget what that represents. But yes, and it, you know, I take your point. And in the 70s and 80s, somehow, I don't even remember this, debt became more valuable than anything. It became leverage. So, Laurie, did you have a question? Okay. Thank you, by the way, thanks. You know I grew up in Toledo, Ohio. Yes, I do, that's and right. And I grew up in Toledo, Ohio, and, and I love that city, and I love my roots and, and all that. But as I've looked around other Rust Belt cities and growing up in a hardware family and so forth, I don't see the pride that I see in Pittsburgh. There, there's a unique thing about the pride that's here. And you, you've spoken of the adversity, that certainly must have been, but the other cities experienced diversity too. Why is Pittsburgh so unique in that? Why they is didn't have the stillers. <laughs> <laughs> did, did they have the stillers or did the stillers have Pittsburgh? They could be either way. Yeah, I, you know, that's a great, mm -hmm. I, I try not to say this because I enjoy every question that comes my way, but that question is particularly sticky. Do you have any guesses? No, that's why I asked the question. <laughs> <laughs> as, as you know, lots of times guesses, uh, and questions are asked because the answer is waiting. Christopher, you can take a shot at that? Sports, you have to go a lot of, on a lot of the sports. So sports, sports definitely had a, had a factor in the 70s. The Pirates are pretty good. Um, and the Steelers, you know, on the rise through the 70s. It's, so I think that lifted spirits, I, that community. We had each other. We're getting together every Sunday for football games and, the, you know, Sunday dinners and football games. So uh, definitely, I think, you know, had, a, had an effect on, on the morale of the, of the area. Doesn't it, that guy it look like, sound like he could be my brother? <laughs> it's because he is, and my other brother is next to him, Mark. <clears throat> I, I don't know. That's a, that's a really good question. I, I think there are people who would agree with you that the um, – that other t manufacturing centers and cities. Uh, Cleveland, there's certainly there's pride. There's pride in all these places. But something happened in Pittsburgh that, and, and you know what? I'll tell you what I, what I what's a one possibility as well. This wasn't just, Pittsburgh was not just the home of European immigrants. Pittsburgh was also the home of our brothers and sisters from the South, of people of color who came here and made it a, a very distinct place. It also happened in Chicago. It also happened in Detroit. But I think that kind of diversity is, is I think we were, we were proud of that diversity, of that difference. Not only different ethnicities, Ambridge, how many years did they have the nationality days in Ambridge just to celebrate the diversity of their people. So that, I think that was part of it. Anybody else? Yes, sir. You know, it's great to be nostalgic. Nobody loves history more than I do. But I tell my grandkids, you know, this is going to be someday their good old days. We had ours, and I love to talk about them. They love to tell me I'm full of useless information. <laughs> and I say, it's not useless, it's just timely. You'll figure it out later. But this will be their good old days, and I'm, I think the, uh, our community is doing a lot to establish positive things for that gen our generation coming up. So if the, I, you know, that's a great piece of wisdom. So I'm looking at young people here. Can you hear yourself saying that in 40 years? I hope so, too. I really do. Hi. Um, to come off of what Bill Perryman just said, I'm on the board of another small, small town near here. Mm -hmm. And everybody started out with, oh, well, the way it was, the way we remember. And the gentleman who's our leader said, we're not doing this for us. We're doing it for the children because 
we're making memories for them. And someday they will be, oh, remember when? The same as we're doing now. And it's our responsibility to bring those new memories. That's really well put. I couldn't say so myself. Nostalgia is a tricky word. Do we have any Greeks in the audience? Anybody can speak Greek? Nostalgia is a Greek word. Nostos, meaning past. Alja, meaning sickness. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so it can become a real burden sometimes to, to, to uh, be too much overwhelmed by nostalgia. The past can teach us many things. I think many people can attest that um, a fully realized life is one that is full of, of, of loving and fulfilling memories. So we're making memories all the time, but we have to watch that we don't, that we don't get stuck and think that our time or that time was better than any other time and it's just gone, something is gone. One thing that I really try to cut off and and I, in rereading recently, I f found out I was guilty of it. I used this word once, and I've learned since. Don't let anybody talk to you about a dying town. <laughs> People die. Towns don't die, usually. They just change. They get smaller, they get bigger, they get different, they get worse, they get better, but they don't die. And we like to, I mean, look at, all around Pittsburgh are the toughest, the toughest parts of, of the rebound in Pittsburgh are in places like Etna and Braddock and places that have not felt this new resurgence of prosperity. But they're not dead. They're, and they're probably not dying. They're just changing. And so I, I reject that concept of the dying town. We can't give up. Anybody else? Well, once again, thank you. I have books to sell if you want them. And yeah. half of every sale goes to this wonderful organization. Oh, wow. Um, would you like to pull the raffle for, for the free, free copy? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you make me say it. All right, the number is 219-362. Right here? <laughs> All right. I, I'm trusting that. Uh, awesome. And uh, before you sit down, we also have a, a gift that we want to offer you. Um, I'm going to ask Regina to come up. She's on our, on our lecture series committee. <laughs> you know, what a nice role to play. <laughs> we really appreciate you taking time from your, your busy life to come and share your story with us, and it's riveting. It's, it's always good to hear the author read. There's nothing like that. So this is just a little token of our appreciation for your time. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. How much do we have for this one? What's that? Can I, how much are, 20 how much bucks. are 20 bucks for the books. <laughs> Um, just a couple uh, things for closing up. Um, I just want to thank uh, all the different people that are involved in making this series and tonight possible. Um, the Beaver Falls Community Development Corporation is hosting this event and has a lecture series committee that does a lot of work uh, to set up the event and plan and invite the speaker speakers, so we want to thank them for that. The library lets us use this space every year for free, and l yeah, let's, let's give it a round of applause for the library. It's really generous of them, and we really appreciate the space. 
Uh, we also have a couple of sponsors. Um, City House, a living learning community in downtown Beaver Falls for Geneva College students, helps to sponsor this event, as well as the Beaver Falls Recreation Board and West Banco. So we just really appreciate uh, them putting the funding together for this. And I just want to add that for tonight in particular, I'm going to consider Mr. Hernecki also a sponsor because he traveled from New Hampshire and we did not have the money for traveling costs or anything. And he said, sure, I'll just come because, uh, because Amber just deered him. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. But yeah, thank you all for coming. Um, please feel free to take refreshments with you. Feel free to uh, buy, buy books. Uh, feel free to drop off any petitions that you signed um, at that table right by where Kathy is. Feel free to take some to share or uh, share about that online as well. What? Uh, right, Kathy back there is, oh, if you take them, if you take them, um, talk to me <laughs> and I'll give you like my phone number or email address or something and I can pick them up from you. You do not have to live in the city. Sure, I'll get those for you. Yeah. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a good night.